I praise God for the blessing that he has been in my life. And it's evident to me that there has been a great blessing of God on this church family these last 35 years. Just Amen. look around yourself. This is the fruit of God's blessing over three decades of ministry. And I, I've just been incredibly blessed this morning. So, in my role as national president of our fellowship, of which your church is a family, a member family of that fellowship, I want to bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ from your fellow fellowship, Baptist churches across Canada from coast to coast to coast. We praise God on this occasion in which we are celebrating the 35th anniversary. Happy anniversary, everyone. Give yourself an applause. Thank you for the opportunity to come and to address the church family. This is a bit of a special church for me because like any other missionary or ministry leader, I have to raise my own funds as well. And guess what? You're one of the churches who have come alongside of Marilyn and I. And it's just so good to know that there are churches particularly praying for us. But also, as president, I'm not supposed to have any favorites, but I do. And uh, thank you so much for the support. It's uh, deeply deeply grateful for it. Well, it's been a blessing. I mean, the choirs have been just remarkable. And that children's choir, I got a video of that because I'm going to show that across Canada. I mean, there's a little bugging paparazzi somewhere. <laughs> in the um, Brother John, I think you're going to be losing your job. <laughs> that was remarkable. We praise God. Well, I want to start by telling you a story. Who is heard of the author, the famous, probably the most famous American author of the 19th century. His name is Samuel Clemens. You heard of him? What name does he normally go by? Mark Twain. And if you were in grade 10 in Ontario, you got to read Huckleberry Finn, most of us anyway. Mark Twain. Unfortunately, Mark, Mark Twain, while he was a humorist, in many respects, both some of the most remarkable books you could read, he was fairly jaded by the church through some hurts in life, through suffering. He lost one of his most beloved daughters early on in life, and he wasn't overly enamored by the church itself. You know, basically, Pastor, he wasn't sure if the church really measured up to the message it actually preached. Some people do complain about that. So he said he, he, he did an experiment. He got a cage with a, with a door, and he, he opened up the door, and he, he threw in a dog and a cat. I mean, two mortal enemies, at least we're told. But much to his surprise, within a very short period of time, with some adjustments, this dog and this cat seemed to get along. So he upped the ante. He let the dog and the cat out, he opened the door, and he took three of the most cantankerous barn animals. He took a billy goat and a big, fat, Hall and a nasty nipping goose, and he threw those three barn animals into that cage, and he slammed the door shut. He sure there would be World War III, but in a very short period of time, once again, some adjustments, the three animals seemed to get along. He said he upped the ante on his experiment, so he opened the door and let the barn animals out of the cage, and with the door still open, he said, I took hold of a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, and a Catholic. Close the door. In less than a minute, there wasn't a living thing left in that cage. Now, he had a point. The point is, unlike barn animals, we sometimes don't get along. And I imagine in the 35 years of CABC, there have been occasions, as wonderful as this morning is, and the blessing of God is clearly on this church, there have been occasions where you look back and say, that wasn't our finest hour. When the, the love of which Jesus in John 13 says, how are we to be uh, characterized, how are we to be known by our love? mercy, our grace, our loving kindness, as new translations seem to be translating the word grace. Loving kindness. This is what's supposed to characterize who we are. A Bible commentary of another generation ago, Donald Gray Barnhouse, said, 
Love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes upward is service, evangelism. But love that stoops, love that bends, is grace. Now what was he saying by saying that? Because I've, I've entitled the message this morning, Love That Stoops. He was looking at the Old Testament word in which we translate into the English Bible as grace. And the Old Testament word is chassid. It's Hebrew, of course. The word chassid means grace, or it's translated grace wherever it's found in the Old Testament. But it literally, in the English language, literally translated, translates as stoop, to bend. God chose to stoop. He chose to bend. God chose not to give us what we do deserve. We are sinners. We have fallen. And in this fallen state, we deserve wrath. We deserve his judgment. He's a just God. He will treat us justly. It's a promise. It's a great promise. That we will always be treated fairly, justly. But the bad news story on that is that fallen creatures, sinners, are going to be treated justly. God chooses instead to bend, to stoop, and not treat us as we justly deserve, but to treat us with his grace and his mercy. You know, when I was thinking about what to speak about this morning, and the theme being blessed to bless the nations, I love the theme. I thought, you know what, the greatest blessing we can be to the nations, to this country and to the nations around the world, is to be agents of that grace. To be dispensers of that loving kindness. In fact, it is the most potent evangelistic weapon in our arsenal. To be people of grace, agents of grace, showing random acts of kindness, loving kindness, to people who may not even deserve it. This is powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Years ago, C.S. Lewis walked into a conference on comparative religions. He walked in late. A group of scholars and academics were in a room, and they were clearly debating. Lewis walked in on the conversation late, and Lewis is, off, is famous for the Narnian tales. Many of you are familiar with that. He walked in on the conversation late, but caught up fairly quickly what they were talking about. What they were actually arguing and debating was, what one thing does Christianity offer the world amongst the pantheon of world religions? What one dis distinct, unique thing does Christianity offer that is not offered by other world religions? And they were debating. They were not coming to any conclusion until C.S. Lewis said, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. No other faith, no other world religion offers Grace. Everything is by works. Hindus have karma. Muslims have their code, their law. Jews have the covenant. And on and on and on and on. Christianity is the only faith group who dares to even think of the idea that we receive something that we do not deserve and we receive it freely. Not because we've done anything, but because someone has done something for us on our behalf. Grace. Now, preachers often don't go to the Old Testament to take a look at grace, but I can assure you, throughout the pages of the Old Testament scriptures, God's grace is dripping through those pages over and over and over again. The story that we're looking at this morning briefly is a story in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I encourage you to go back there. I think uh, Michael read it just earlier in, in, in the morning. It's a story of God's grace and how we can be agents of this grace to a lost and needy, spiritually needy world. You have to go back 3,000 years to a brutal time, a time in history in which a toppled king, a king who has lost his crown, who has lost the throne, the rest of the family were also in jeopardy. This is a time in which... Uh, um, uh, uh, King Saul and his son Jonathan are killed in battle. And there's a passage there in 2 Samuel chapter 4, if I can see that slide. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. I can't see it, so you're going to have to read it for yourself. But 
uh, basically the scripture gives us some of the the uh, the understory that goes on later in chapter nine. What's happened? A great battle is ensued. King Saul, Prince Jonathan have both been killed in battle. This is a national tragedy. They know that the enemy is going to come and take over the land. And the rest of the king's family know that they are going to be marked because no incoming ruler wants any rivals. And what usually happens to the extended family of the king is they're either killed, they're exiled, or they're put in prison. And so they are scattering, scattering all over the place. And the nursemaid of Prince Jonathan's son named Mephibosheth, in her haste, she picks up little infant Mephibosheth, but in her haste she drops him and he somehow disabled or crippled in some way. We're not given any details, but we recognize that he's not well. Now you'll see in the bottom corner there, what, what is that? That is a bonafide Toronto cockroach, and there's a few of them around. This is the picture I want you to think of when you think of what's going on in 2 Samuel 4. My wife and I, when we first married, could not find an apartment. I mean, there was just nothing available in Toronto. We finally got a place at Young and Shepherd, just off of Young and Shepherd, not a really nice apartment. That's all we could find. I don't in no way want to intimate that my wife does not keep a very clean house. She's a nurse. She's a germaphobe. But it was impossible. And I used to put my hand over her eyes when I was there. Flip on the switch in the kitchen. No matter how clean we get it, I say, honey, don't look for about 1.2 seconds. And I flip the switch, and you saw the cockroach. <laughs> and I say, okay, you can look now, honey. Let's go eat our yummy food that has already been you know, nibbled away at. That's the picture of what's going on here. Saul's family, like cockroaches. <laughs> In the pandemic, in the panic, they're just scattered because they know they're going to be killed or imprisoned. Now we move about 20 years forward, approximately 20 years forward, and we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm not going to take the time to read over the passage once again. Michael has done that for us. But let's walk through the passage fairly, fairly quickly this morning. In verse 1, we read, uh, David has now been, you know, in, in charge of the land for about 20 years. And it's been a good 20 years. A really good 20 years. And one evening, he's sitting in his palace in the cool of the evening. He's sort of reminiscing, it's a bit nostalgic, but reminiscing as you're doing over 35 years of blessing. David's been doing, doing pretty good for the last couple decades, and he's reminiscing and uh, he's feeling healthy, he's feeling happy, I mean, things are going well. I mean, he's broadened this, this, this nation of Israel. Historians would call this the golden age of Israel because it was a golden age. It had broadened from 6,000 square miles to 60,000 square miles, and the nations surrounding David respected him. He didn't ever lose in battle. And they respected his God, Jehovah. They knew this was a powerful God. David was basking that one evening. He probably had someone reading the chronicler, reading back some of the chronicles of the history of the past 20 years. And he comes to verse 1. And we read in verse 1. One day, David began wondering if anyone in Saul's family was still alive. Although he may not have been involved in the demise of Saul's extended family, likely he wasn't. But he knew what other people, what other cronies would have done in Saul's family. He's wondering if anybody's still alive. For he had promised Jonathan, remember David and Jonathan, Prince Jonathan, were the best of friends. They were, there was a kinship between these two men, the best of friends. He had promised Jonathan that he would show kindness to them. There's that word, kindness. Yes. You see that word kindness in this passage at least three or four times? That's the Hebrew word, chassid, grace. That's grace. We're learning about grace. Now, some call this, theologians call this, that Jonathan is serving as a type of Christ. It's a theological term that basically says that he's a metaphor. He's an analogy of what Christ has done on our behalf. David is going to do something to Jonathan's son, not because his son deserves anything. In fact, he's done nothing to deserve anything. He's doing it because of Jonathan. We receive God's grace not because we have done anything, 
but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. So this is a beautiful story of grace and salvation, but as a call to believers to become agents of that grace. Starting in verse 2, Ziba is introduced. Ziba was a servant of King Saul years before. He's now a servant of David these low, low these 20 years. And he says, yeah, yeah, there is. And in verses 3 through verse 5, we get a sense in which he's describing who this individual is. But I, it doesn't come out and say it clearly. But you get a sense, at least written between the lines of the verses, that he's not overly enamored by this son of Jonathan. Ziba's sort of saying to David, he's not like one of the courtiers that we have at the palace these last two decades. They're brave, honorable men who go out and fight and win wars. This guy's kind of a loser. He's kind of a, a, a hermit living in the, out in the outback in, the, in a place that nobody knows about. But you get the sense right away that David is not interested in the man's resume. He is interested in fulfilling a promise he's made to the father. Jonathan, Prince Jonathan. And he wants to meet this son of Jonathan, this prince, one of the last remaining members of Saul's extended family. He wants to meet him. And he's told that he's living in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar is one of those sanctuary cities that you see in the Old Testament. And when you did something really stupid or really bad and you didn't think there was going to be justice, there was going to be just a vengeful crowd will take you, you ran to one of these sanctuary cities. Lodabar is way up there. I mean, I, I went to my Bible atlas to find a place, Lodabar. And you go north of the Sea of Galilee, going into Syria, and then you make a bit of a slight right going east, and you come to this wilderness, this desert area, and there's a tell, or a bit of a hump of just ruins, which is formerly Lodabar. It was a sanctuary, a walled city, in which people who were trying to hide from their past. Anybody like that in this room? In the city? Try and go, you're, you're going 100 miles an hour trying to hide from the past so you don't have to remember it. Guilt, shame, I don't know what it is, but you're hiding from your, you're not dealing with your past, you're running to Lodabar. Now the interesting thing about this Hebrew word, Lodabar, this city called Lodabar, a Hebrew word, literally, once again in English, Lodabar, literally in English, means barren place. Barren place. I well imagine that in Scarborough there are a lot of folks who are living in spiritual barrenness who need to learn about the good news. That God has grace. The funny thing is that Mephibosheth, these last 20 years, he's been hiding in this barren place, hiding from the very person who could extend grace to him, King David. You see, when you live in Lodabar long enough, in Scarborough, when you live in Lodabar, a spiritual barren place long enough, you start to try to convince yourself, Lodabar's not such a bad place, well, after all. And you chase after anything that fills that void in your heart that's empty, that will only be filled by a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you fill it with anything you can to stop the pain. You live in Lodabar long enough. You start to convince yourself, well, it's not such a bad place. Hey, lots of people are going to hell. It's going to be party time. Man, you have no idea what separation from God is for your all eternity. God offers his grace while people run to love God. We have been given the responsibility to be a blessing to this community, to be agents of that grace. To allow them to see what it means to live in relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And they need to see it in meaningful, authentic, winsome ways. Not judgment, but winsome, loving, kindness kind of ways. So, um, uh, 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 someone is sent, obviously sent to Lodabar to pick up Mephibosheth and bring him back to David because David wants to extend grace to, to Mephibosheth. He doesn't know this yet. And in the next verses, verses 5 through uh, about verse 7, we, 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 let me draw the picture once again for you. Imagine Mephibosheth in the great city of Lodabar with all the other misfits who have been hiding from their past. And the guard on top of the wall yells out, a chariot approaches. Now, very few chariots approach 
in any given year in Lodabar. And right away, Mephibosheth starts getting nervous. Is this the day I'm going to find the defender? Is this the day in which the king is finally going to catch me? And then the guard on the wall yells out, It's one of the king's chariots! And he's panicking. Just like a cockroach, he makes his way into his house to the kitchen. No, not the kitchen. He makes his way to his bedroom. He barricades the door. He's hiding under his bed. When one of the king's men gets off his chair and knocks down the door of his apartment, knocks down the door of his bedroom, and yells out, Mephibosheth, King David wants to see you immediately. You see, when you live in Lodabar long enough, not only do you try to convince yourself this barren place ain't so bad after all, when you live in Lodabar long enough, you actually start to believe the lies they say about your Savior. He had convinced himself that King David didn't want to extend grace and mercy. He had convinced himself that the only thing King David wanted to do is chop off his head. Judge him. And he was wrong. Completely, utterly wrong. I read a story a number of years ago of a woman who was getting out of a grocery store in Texas. She had two bags of groceries and she came to her car and she got into the car and she placed the two bags into the, the passenger seat and she's in the driver's seat, of course, and she puts her keys into the ignition and before she starts the car, she adjusts her rear view mirror. And she notices in her rearview mirror that there's a pickup truck behind her and a man a little higher up in the pickup truck, because there's a lot of pickup trucks in Texas, let me tell you. And this guy's in his pickup truck and she notices him and he's very animated and he's yelling and he just, he's just going away and she realizes he's yelling at her. That creeps her up. She starts the car as quickly as possible. She gets herself out of that parking lot at that grocery store. Much to her chagrin, she notices that he peels out and starts to follow her. She gets onto the road. She goes in and out, swerving in and out of the traffic, trying to trying to lose this guy, but he's keeping he's keeping pace with her. She gets onto the onto the highway and she's just racing down that highway way faster than she should, trying to lose him. But once again, she notices this man in the pickup truck is keeping pace with her. She races into her subdivision. She comes up to her driveway. She stops her car in her driveway. She leaves the groceries. She takes hold of her keys and she runs to the front door of her house, jumbling with the keys, trying to get the right key to get it in the slot right away so she can get the safety behind the door in her house. When she notices that the man in the pickup truck comes in, parks in very quickly behind her car, he gets out of his pickup truck, he doesn't run towards her at the front door, no, he runs towards her car, so she stops. What's going on here? He runs towards her car, he opens up the back seat of her car and pounces on an intruder who had been hiding in her back seat with a big butcher's knife. Oh. 20 minutes earlier, lady, get out of your car! There's a crazy man in the back seat. He's got a knife! He's got a knife! Get out of your car! For 20 minutes, she's been running for her safety. You see, when you live in Lodabar long enough, you actually start to believe your Savior may be your enemy. And this is where we are today, in Scarborough, in Canada. We live in an ABC society, anything but Christianity, in which the media and the other elites have misconstrued the good news that Jesus is your Savior who loves you. And they have made it into some sort of evil caricature that is only here to judge you and to ruin society. And they're wrong. But what are we going to do about it? We're going to be agents of grace. Not secret agents. We're going to be pretty public about it. We're going to love people in small ways and large ways. Break down the walls. Build the bridges. Don't show judgment. Show grace. Do it in winsome, wonderful, nourishing ways. Build relationships that are so attractive, they'll say, why do you do the things you do? That's no way to share Jesus. In a society that has turned its back largely on people of faith. So how does it end? Well, at the end, 
Uh, Mephibosheth finally comes to his senses and he comes in verse 8 and he says, before David, as he stands before David and says, hey, what's David's words? Don't be afraid. You look in the New Testament, the Gospels, Jesus referenced to most people, one of the most often references, fear not. You see, people are so unaware of what we do that it's an awkward thing to walk into a church nowadays. They're not necessarily attracted to come. We've got to go to them. It's got to be much more missional. And, and, and in a sense, Jesus is saying, fear not. Don't, don't be frightened by what this. This is all good. And the Mishra finally realizes the depth of the sin, and he says in verse 8, I feel like a dead dog in Lodabar. And I just got back from Indonesia, and I was looking at a market one evening, one of the saddest places I have ever been. I, I was in Egypt about a year ago, and, I, and there's a Christian enclave in Egypt as well where they collect all the garbage in the city. It's just it's called the garbage city. These places are just dead dogs, dead cats, dead rats everywhere. It, was, it looked like hell to me. There's nothing more pathetic than a dead cat or dead dog just in the throes of death because it's just been run over by a truck. I said, this is his, I feel like a dead dog in Lodabar. He knows he's got the way to sin. And he is assured by David, no, I'm going to adopt you into my family. Now there's that New Testament analogy that all of us who are in Christ have been adopted into his family. I'm going to adopt you into your, my family. Does David come through? Verse 7, verse 10, verse 11, verse 13. He does. In fact, we're told that uh, Ziba and his family and servants will take care of all the land that Saul used to have, which will now become Mephibosheth's land. They'll cultivate it and harvest it. And he lives now at the palace with the king, treated as a son, as a far cry from his days in Lodabar. So picture with me once again what that might look like. Here comes David into the great banqueting hall for the evening meal. He sits at the head table, this large table, and I think there's a slide there with a table full of the, the, the bounties of blessing for this family. And in comes his, his daughter, uh, Tamar, and she comes and sits to her father's left side as his princess. And then in comes her brother, Ammon, and then other groups of sons come in, because David had a lot of sons. He uh, was fruitful and multiplied it. And then in comes Solomon. Solomon leaves his study, his library, studious, wise Solomon. He leaves that and comes and sits at the right hand of his father, of course, because he is the heir apparent. And then in comes Absalom, who would be such typical days ahead for David later on, with his long, curly black hair, kind of jacked, comes walking in. And he sort of gives one of these to Solomon, because he's the heir apparent, and I'm not, and straddles his chair. And then comes uh, Joab, the great general who had won all of those battles, ramrod straight, he comes in and he takes his seat and then they wait. They wait. The whole family waits and waits and waits. And then they hear it. It's the crutches of Mephibosheth who's trying to make his way through this his crippled legs, trying to make his way to the banquet hall. He gets in there, he collapses in his chair, and he looks at King David and says, I'm so sorry for being late once again. And David stops him. Mephibosheth, it. you never have to apologize. It's such a blessing to have you at our family table once again. Do you think Mephibosheth understood grace? He did. Every evening he came to a, to a table full of abundance. The abundant life he was experiencing that Jesus promises us. Every evening he came to this table and it was a reminder of receiving something he didn't deserve. He was overwhelmed by it. So let me close with one last story. We started with the greatest American author of the 19th century. Let's end with probably one of the greatest American authors of the 20th century. His name, Ernest Hemingway. You probably heard that, that dude's name. Ernest Hemingway, one of the, one of the uh, most prominent 
uh, authors of the first and, and half of the 20th century. And this was a man who was a rebel from start to end when he committed suicide. But he knew the gospel. His mother had raised him in the church. She had been a, a choir director at a prestigious church in Chicago. His paternal grandfather had been the uh, financial director of the YMCA for all of Chicago in the 1890s for about 10 years, back in the days when the YMCA was a clearly Christian organization. He had grandparents who had served as missionaries in China. He knew the gospel and rejected it. And unfortunately, there was not enough others who came alongside of him that he was willing to listen to break down those barriers. But he tells a story. He wrote a small short story of a Spanish family. He loved Spain. He had fought in the Civil War in the 1930s. He loved Spain. He loved to talk about it. He loved going to the bullfights. He loved everything about Spain. The story he told was the story of a father with two sons. This may be familiar. One son said, I want out of here. I'm sick of your rules. I want I want my inheritance, and I'm going to go live up in Madrid, in the capital city of Madrid, and that's what happened. And with the money, he fled to Madrid and lived it up. He lived it a bosh life, a wasteful life. Years passed in which the father became saddened that he was estranged from his son, and he longed to be in relationship with his son once again. And he had no idea how to get in touch with him. So he placed a small ad in the largest circulation newspaper in Madrid called El Liga. And this is what he wrote, Paco. Paco was his son's name, one of the most common names in Spain, Paco. Paco, meet me this Tuesday, Hotel Montana at noon. All is forgiven. Love, Paco. And on Tuesday, the father made his way down the street towards Hotel Montana, a beautiful five-star expat type of church with a large courtyard around the hotel itself. And he turned the corner, looking face on at the hotel in this large courtyard. And in the courtyard were 800 young men, all with the name Bob. <laughs> all looking for forgiveness from dad. There are tons of people on your street, in your schools, in your workplaces, who are desperately looking for grace. For grace that only can be found in a relationship with Jesus. And I don't know why, but God in his infinite wisdom has chosen his church to be the dispensers, the instrument in which they learn about that grace. So please, don't keep your candle under a bush. Shine. Become a blessing that will bless Scarborough, that will bless Toronto, that will bless Ontario, that will bless Canada, and bless the nations. Amen? Amen. Father, we are grateful for this story, this keen reminder of the responsibility we have to be agents of this grace and mercy. Father, name we show loving kindness, even to those who are really difficult to show. Father, may we surprise them by our graceful demeanor, that our lives would be characterized by mercy and grace, Father. So that, Father, you might do the work only you can do through the ministry of your Spirit, and that is the regenerating of the hearts of men and women and children to come to faith in Jesus Christ, so that in 35 years, if you should choose to tarry, we're going to get a whole lot larger banquet hall mm -hmm. for the next anniversary. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all.